So once again, good afternoon and welcome to this session of uh, the role of the church. We have got two speakers for the session and uh, they will each get 25 minutes and then we'll have some uh, time left for questions as well. And I think the speakers now are ready and the mic is ready as well. Oh, it's for TV, yes. TV. Yes. Our first guest and speaker today is uh, Reverend uh, Christopher Ferguson from the United Church of Canada. And I just had a lecture of what is the uh, United Church of Canada. And I learned very much that it was a social justice tradition church. And uh, it fits very well in thinking, I think, with the Sabil tradition as well. Mr. and Reverend Christopher Ferguson has been working for the World Council of Churches for many years. He's now back in Canada, but he was uh, a representative to the uh, United Nations in New York for World Council of Churches and responsible all for the advocacy work and for the advocacy weeks in uh, New York. And before that, he was also in uh, Jerusalem and working with advocacy for the Palestinian groups, also for uh, other oppressed peoples here in uh, this area. And we welcome you very much and are looking forward to speak to us on the church of an empire. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Astrid. I think I can uh, lay this down. I can be heard. Is that right? For the people that... Yeah. This mic is not actually for us. It's for the, uh, the TV, as I was told, the video. So good afternoon. Good How's everybody doing? Well fed? Yes. And de well fed by uh, Dick Horsley's excellent presentation? Yes. yes. And beginning to feel... Uh, critically uh, engaged and uh, ready to break out of paradigms that have captivated us, that have made it difficult, if not impossible, to carry out the core vision of our covenant with the God of life. Because I was asked to pick up the question that one of the, uh, the folks raised about the relationship between church and empire. Remember when Professor Horsley was asked, so what do you make of this anti-imperial Jesus movement that then in fact became the chaplain of empire? And what do I make of it? Uh, I make of it that we are in a long trajectory, like Mitri Raheb said in the morning, where we should zoom back and look at the long sweep of our history over thousands of years, and we'll find out that the earliest and deepest testimonies is that to love and know God, to walk in God's way, is inimical, contradictory, and incompatible with any relationships of domination, injustice, or oppression. And at the very root of to know God is to create relationships of equality and to try and free ourselves from bondage. And that this message has been grabbed and imperialized. And one of the great interesting dilemmas that we have is that empires have been able to use the message of liberation to, in fact, captivate, destroy, and oppress. But there is a thin titanium wire running through that history, and it transmits nothing less or more than freedom. And it gets stronger and more vibrant at certain moments. And for Christians, one of those strongest and most vibrant moments was the Jesus movement and Jesus of Galilee. But just to say that we locate ourselves in this moment 
and I'm going to kind of cut to the chase to say where I want to end is with an understanding that where we stand in terms of resistance to empire and specifically in terms of standing with the Palestinian people as they seek to free themselves and create freedom and equal relationships through the logic of love, where we stand on that question is in fact, I would contend, a status confessionis. It's what makes or breaks our understanding if we are within the circle of the faith. These are key issues for us. The resistance to empire is not an optional extra for Christians, but is in fact the core of our faith and our relationship with God. If you don't agree with that, I can tell. <laughs> you know, when part of this great arc, it's interesting that the earliest Christian community, of course, uh, post-resurrection, would meet, and just like Sabio, one of the meanings in Arabic is the way, they were people of the way, and they lived uh, precariously in trying to create these communities that Professor Horsley talked about, alternative communities of life, where they were refusing to be in bondage. Remember how in Acts it talks about holding all things in common and refusing to abide by the, uh, by the death-dealing um, uh, economics and politics of the, of the Roman Empire. And, but of course it was dangerous. And so when one Christian met another, they could just casually in the sand draw a half circle. The other person casually comes by and completes the other arc to make a sign of a fish. And then what did they do? They kissed. And when the Romans saw this kiss, they named it conspiratio. They're breathing together. Conspiratio. To breathe together. To share the oxygen of life, the hua, to build together communities of life in resistance to empire was in fact the early uh, mark of the Christian community. So what went wrong, right? Where did we get off track? And we, we got off track um, um, most famously, although there were elements, of course, where the Christian community uh, tried to navigate and negotiate empire. That there were different levels of direct confrontation and so on. But notion, the central understanding of Jesus as, as Lord was a direct repudiation of the Lordship of Caesar. And that most of our theological language is empire reversal language, as we, we, we read in a lot of the good work of de Corsley. So what is taken as, uh, as Jesus' uh, 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 understanding as Savior, of course, is in counterdistinction to Augustus as Soter and so on. But as we move along, we find that, of course, uh, Constantine is able to co-opt the Christian church for to be three things, as we mentioned. One, it fundamentally, to be the chaplain of empire, but also to be its minister of propaganda. But most importantly, the administrator of the opate that keeps people doctored by creating a, a spirituality that actually has people willfully embrace, take in, and internalize the servility, docility, and obedience that is necessary for empire. And it uses empire's traditional tool for doing this, which is, among other things, it embraces the rules of hierarchy and patriarchy. And so patriarchy is uh, not only a social system, but it is a part of a particularly ordering. So besides the, the putting uh, women in a subordinate place, besides the lifting up of the rule of older men and so on, it also is based on an ideology where the highest possible signs of devotion isn't proactively seeking out and loving and embracing, but in fact obeying, following, submitting, serving. And what happens is, is the deep